The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. My name is Craig Sylvester. I'm a sales consultant for MySQL practice at Oracle. Um, I've been with MySQL since around 2005. Uh, so I've had quite a bit of history with it. I'm going to talk about MySQL from the command line. Uh, the tools are available, how to run some of the scripts. Um, this is probably best if you kind of know MySQL, but are maybe just getting started. If you're into MySQL, you know how it works, you work with the command line all the time. Start to stop servers, you install, you do all that stuff, you'll be bored. Just let you know. Um, and I'm going to mix up slides with going to uh, a VM that I have running Linux and just doing some live demos with some of the tools that are available. Alright, so let's get started. Uh, so, what we'll cover is uh, actually the first step we've done uh, installing the RPMs. Um, pretty easy. If you've done RPM installs, we have RPMs for Various Linux flavors. Um, it's, it's an easy way to get it. I was in Peter's talk, so I know that uh, you would use distributions. That's another way. Well, another way. A lot of people install MySQL. Um, they just use what comes with you know, Red Hat or CentOS or um, whatever Linux distribution you're using. Uh, then we'll go into well, once you get it installed, how do you set up the configuration? How do you change the configuration? Um, where is the configuration? Where does it put it? Uh, it where, where should you keep it? Um, I can show you from the, the MySQL server standpoint where it's going to look for a configuration file if you don't specify one when you start the server. Um, things like that. So we'll go into how to create user accounts. Um, if you sat through some of the other MySQL talks, they may have already talked about how we authenticate users. Um, well, we can get a little deeper into there if you would like. How do you assign privileges? Uh, again, if you're familiar with SQL or uh, relational databases, and you work with Oracle or Sybase or one of those other relational databases, or your Postgres, and you've done grant privileges, I mean, it's basically the same thing. You can manage it in time. Um, and how do you get data in? So, somebody gives you a database, somebody gives you a file, how do you get it into the server? Um, somebody gives you a schema, how do you get it into the server without well, sitting there and tagging it in by hand? And some other tools and utilities that can help, and some community uh, tool sets that are actually very helpful for, uh, for maintaining and monitoring my So I was in the last talk with Peter, and uh, he asked a question how many people are using MySQL. I'll ask it again, knowing that maybe the same people in here could be some new ones, but MySQL users that have set up MySQL before, um, would you consider yourself uh, uh, advanced? <laughs> uh, intermediate, you know, just getting started. Um, is it part of your, uh, so uh, are you a DBA, a high school DBA by your job? Is that your job? You know, right here? That's their day to day job, all right? Um, is it part of, I'll oh, ask one last question. So is it MySQL part of other databases that you monitor and maintain? Oracle, uh, site those types of things. All right. So, uh, again, so there are various startup scripts and startup programs for MySQL. MySQL D is the primary binder, the enterprise, not the enterprise. The uh, PXQL, the MySQL server, multi threaded server, execute. Uh, MySQL is a state, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with it. It's a script that helps you start the database. Um, it also starts a second process out there. It, it stays up and running and watches the MySQL database and can uh, restart it if you do uh, that type of thing. Um, it's the most common way for Linux that MySQL gets started. There are some uh, init scripts that we automatically install. So if you do an RPM install, or maybe if you, I don't do uh, uh, distribution installs as much, 
Um, but I, I suspect that the same is that they'll put a MySQL or MySQL D or MySQL server in its script. Uh, and it's in the DNS setting up to boot MySQL on startup, shut it down, and then on shut down, those types of things. Um, and the last one is MySQL Multi. It, it's been around there for a long time. I don't know if anybody ever runs MySQL Multi. Uh, I know in the, I came on during the Bible days, and I know during the Bible days it was, it was problematic, so um, I didn't know many folks that were running it. Um, and just, as reference, I'll, I'll put the URL at the bottom as reference as we go along. So uh, if you get the slide deck ready, you can go and, um, and uh, get more information about those various utility uh, programs. So client programs. Number one client program that everybody's got to be familiar with is the MySQL files. It's how you're going to log into the server. It's how you're going to uh, check how performance is doing, check what users are doing. Uh, you'll probably use it to check and see what users are running. Um, we're starting to add uh, databases, uh, performance, the performance database, the performance schema database, those types of uh, features into the server so that you have something that you can go and query and really figure out what's going on in MySQL. Uh, we're trying to give, give you much better diagnostics on what the impact of SQL queries are, what the file, file I/O impact is per table, um, what the network load is, those types of things. Um, MySQL admin, a great way to uh, quickly check, uh, you can quickly check the variables for a MySQL server from there without logging into the MySQL client. Um, you can, of course, shut down the server. That's one thing most people use it for, is to, to shut down the server clean. And it's got a whole lot of other things that, that you can do you can set the root password, you can use the password all from the MySQL and just add in the utility without, again, without logging into the MySQL client itself. The third one is something that's new with 5.6. So, maybe I'll have to ask some more questions, but I'm going to ask another question. Do you have to run scripts for MySQL that are run by Chrome, let's say, on a nightly basis or a weekly basis, and you have to apply a password to the Right, so right now, there's really no good way to encrypt that password to, to keep it safe from prying eyes. So has anybody ever seen the config manager? Has anybody looked at 5.6 yet to see what's there and, and kind of explored it? So that's one of the binaries now that comes with the 5.6 server. Um, so the config editor will let you basically set up predefined uh, logins to the database and it stores that information into an encrypted file in your home directory. In the, whatever, whatever user set it up, it says it in their home directory. Make it mutable and writable only by you. So, uh, for example, using the config editor, I can set up a local login just on my account to go in and, and look at databases, maybe work with a few databases. I can set up a separate login just for root, the local root account, so that if root needs to go in there and do some things. Um, with the latest releases of MySQL, I can set the mobile login so I can easily, without supplying all the information on the command line or keeping it in an open, uh, unencrypted format on, on the file system, um, I can set up logins to other servers. And just basically say, and I'll show you how this works, but in the MySQL client, you can just say MySQL dash dash login path and give it a name of one of those things that you set up, and it will just use all those things. That file that it keeps, it keeps, it's a binary file, first of all, and it keeps the password encrypted in that file. And the only way to look at that file is through that utility and have to print out the information. So, maybe I answered the question or? I suspect that it's not tied to the or anything like that. No, no. If you change the password or whatever, your backup file is really You need to change that also. Yeah, and there's a way to update that file also. Um, and, and it's, it's not the end-all be all to security, right? I mean, somebody can still pick this. We're, we're probably not using the, the highest levels of encryption algorithm to encrypt the password in there. Um, but it does save you from, if you have to run a nice little dump to do my nightly backups, those types of things, you don't have to supply a password anymore in clear text. Um, so it is, it is one step further to, uh, to kind of locking down the server. 
Uh, MySQL dump. If you've been running MySQL longer than three days, my guess is you use MySQL dump to do something. Um, dump the database, dump the schema, do something. It's very hard to be so. Uh, MySQL import. Mm, some people don't use it, others do. Uh, if, uh, why would you use MySQL import? Well, let's say you got the uh, CSV file. So I heard somebody say something about Excel earlier. So somebody gives you a, a, an Excel CSV file and you need to load it into the database. Well, MySQL will, will let you load that in quite easily into an existing, well, not an existing table. You create a schema based on, on the fields that you want to import. And you can use MySQL import to just say, hey, here's a file that you can import into that table. Um, it's got a lot of options. You can set field delimiters, you can set line delimiters. You can specify which columns you want to load in and which ones you want to ignore, uh, which can be very, very helpful. You can change the value of a column before you actually import it into the database and insert it into the database, which can also be very helpful. Um, and the last is MySQL Slap. MySQL Slap is a performance testing utility. Um, it's a way to generate load into the database. All right, so um, instead of going through the slides, some of these slides are just going to be referential material um, as I see it. Uh, so MySQL D is, again, the server process. So um, So what I was looking for <laughs> and what I don't see, um, and maybe because I had to start writing right now, is we list in the uh, oh, I don't know why. Anybody call my hair? I'll just do it. within the MySQL CNF file. 
So again, if something's not being set, if you think a parameter is being set and it's not for some reason, these are just some things to check. Is it in the right path, or are you giving it the config file when it starts up? And or do you have them under the right hand? Um, so the way you would configure it is you would force it to use a particular file. So you would set the default file equal to a path, a file, and you would force it to use that default file. Um, It, it's it's one way that um, I don't know. Dave, do you know? I, I don't know if the MySQL D state process actually for, uses forces it. I think it does. I think it defaults to one of those, or you can pass it in as a MySQL as a parameter to the MySQL D state process of forces. Um, and again, there's there's a ton of other variables. If you go all the way toward the end. You can see all the variables that it's pulling from those files, or all the variables that are, that are currently set in the server. Um, another utility to use is my print defaults. I'm going to have to sit down because I can't type soon enough. Um, You have the default file. Let's see. And tell it what sections you want to read. And what my first default will do is it will basically tell you how the server will be started up if you use that configuration file and if you use those sections. In the configuration file. So one way is it's a way to document what's being how the server is being started. Um, and of course you can always look at a process listing. And you can look at the for the MySQL process itself. And we started up with all the parameters on the command.
if I set pager to set to the less command, run the same thing, it's going to pipe that command to less. And let you scroll through at your leisure through the result set. You can put any Unix command or any script as a page, which means you can pipe it through Grub. You can say, I want to grab for a particular string out of this result that I'm in the browser. You can pipe it to a script that you wrote that does sophisticated off commands and set commands uh, with your output set, and you can do it for that too. Um, so it's, it's a great little tip to know to, to be able to um, you know, use the client a little more effectively. Uh, to, to turn it off, because it will stay on for all that whole session, you just say no page. You just say pager, and you give it a command. And I put it in a nice vertical output. If you want that to automatically happen, there's an option you can set called, uh, I think it's auto vertical format, something like that. I'll tell you what it is. Save it. So this kind of brings up another point. So you can keep your own config file as a dot file in the home directory, folks know about this, and you can set parameters within there that you always reuse. Um, so you know, for myself, I'm always going to mostly come in as my as Craig as this user. I can set the user. I can even set the password so that I never have to type the user one password when I log into my SQL. Um, I can set a default database and I come in from my SQL client. Um, so there's a lot of things you can set. The other useful thing you can do is you can set the prompt. So you can set the prompt to show what user you are, and you can set the prompt to show what database you're currently connected to, um, which, which I find out very well. Um, So other common options, post, socket file, uh, port, um, other characters all for output. You can also output in the XML format, HTML format, uh, from the MySQL client. So it'll give you a lot of different options. Uh, I've already talked about this, but let's go into config editor a little more because I I actually had someone ask me about a week ago um, that 
was running in 5.1 or some older version of the database, and they said, is there any way to put the password so that we don't have to supply the command line for, for sessions? And I said, well, yes, there is. And we finally made something for five steps. Um, so, instead of relying on my memory. So this is what ends up coming out, right? With the insert statement, multi-row insert statement. Uh, this is fine. Um, I will run all these, but I'll just really show you what they do. So if I say uh, databases world instead of, if I actually tell it a list of databases, even if it's just one, it'll then put the create and use database in the job file. If you just say world, it doesn't. That's just a short name, I suppose. Um, if you just want to look at the schema, you should just say no data. And it'll just dump the schema for a database, or for all databases, or for a particular table. I like 
have this option. I don't know how many of you do the field that way. We also allow you to dump a database and put the schema in one plot and put the data in another plot. So I like it because then I can take that and basically do a parallel load on another machine. I can load, you know, 50 tables at once or 20 tables at once. Instead of having one giant file that has all my tables and all my data. So when, we, when you do the tab option, you say tab and give it a directory. Number one, you have to have the file privileges to be able to do it for MySQL. Number two, that directory, and this is where, if this bites you, this is where it's going to bite you. That directory has to be writable by the, my, by the process that the server is running. In my case, I run as MySQL as well as folks do. But if, it, if the MySQL process can't write to that direction, it'll be right. It's not you running it, it's the actual server running it. So basically, with it, outputs is what you would use MySQL for. Because you can turn around and just say import those files after you create the, the scheme. inserts are faster, but I've actually disabled them in my dumps because if I need to actually, we had a disaster recovery scenario and I had to compare the dumps uh -huh. and diff does not work with extended inserts. No. It doesn't work very well. <laughs> yeah, and, and another good reason to do it would be if you need to move that to another database that's not MySQL. So let's say you're, you're moving to Postgres for some reason. Um, maybe take, care, take advantage of GIS capabilities or something. Um, Postgres doesn't necessarily extend our, understand our extended format, so you need to come back to file it in, in a way that you can understand. Um, or you could, you could dump it out with that tab thing and dump it out of the page. Just tap, either tap those files. Uh, um, we talked about this. I mean, it might still import it, it's handy. The thing to remember with MySQL import, and again, I, I ran into these errors, so I just pointed them out. Um, we, we basically strip off the, the ending of the file, and we use that as a table name. So there's no way to specify the table name in MySQL. Well. That's the way to specify. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just make sure that that file is the same name as your data. Um, so, there's a number of uh, show commands that we might have. Show databases, show tables, um, show storage engines, that's one they changed. Anyway, many of those you can use <laughs> the MySQL show command. Go for it, right? Uh, who does not? Um, you can use MySQL show commands and get the same information. Again, without going into the MySQL. Um, might be useful if you're scripting things out and you need to run it often. Um, I don't use it a whole lot because I, my, my default is just to go to the MySQL client and start typing. Uh, but again, from the scripting standpoint, I can see where this would be helpful. So this last, 
tag here is describe. It's a shorthand for describe table. So those new um, minus two out. If I say describe city, it just could be the columns in the city. But it doesn't tell me what storage engine, it doesn't tell me what index is, it doesn't tell me any little things about the, the table that I'm describing. It just describes the columns. So <coughs> it, you can actually do um, show, create a table, and it will give all that. So here, it, it's basically the create table table. The actual create table table that we use to create that, that particular table. This is actually the one that should be all formatted to not be the actual Why though? MySQL admin, again, start and stop instances. Um, you can flush the logs, flush table, or flush the uh, privileges. If you need to, you can kill sessions uh, that are out there hanging. Um, change passwords. Well, I think most, most, it's most, com most common use case that I've ever seen is to shut down the database. You just might as well, I'm going to shut down, and it'll uh, shut down the database in a clean fashion. Um, so, so MySQL creates what's the transaction log called the binary log in MySQL. Um, and the binary log is created at the server level, not, not, not for a particular storage engine. So, so in the DB actually has its own transaction log uh, that it creates. The MySQL binary log is a transaction log for all storage engines. So regardless of the storage engine, the table stored in, we track all DML operations in this binary log. If you need to look and see what's in that binary log, you can use utility on MySQL bin log. That'll let you dump the binary log. Binary log is a binary format. So it's a good name for the binary. binary. <laughs> so so the, the, the bin log utility lets you dump that information out to an ASCII format. So why would you want to do that? Well, one way you can use it is you can um, see what queries have been run against the database, that's one thing. You can also use it for point in time control. So we let you dump either one binary log, or you can specify a list of them, or you can specify time ranges, and we will dump that information out to a file that you can then apply to maybe get the server back to a, a, a clean state. So let, you know, the, the classic problem where somebody drops a table or drops a database and everybody freaks out because all of a sudden there's no database. Well, how do you get it back? If you have a good backup and you have, if you have binary logs, you can apply the backup, get the binary logs up until that time when they dropped it and get your state, get the state back up to that time. Yes? Do the bin logs include queries or only writes? What's that? Bin logs. Just query, uh, just only writes. DML operations, only insert update release, no, no selects. If you absolutely need to track selects, there's a general log, which is a big no no for extra shots, so don't ever keep it running unless you have lots of disk space and like managing disk space on an hourly basis. <laughs> um, there is um, the slow query log which is definitely something you should make use, probably more in, in development and in QA, but it could also be used in production. Um, one trick you can do, in, uh, in, and I think Acona's toolkit to actually make use of this, is, uh, especially in development, or as you're doing QA testing on your, on your server, you, you set the slow query log on, you set the, the long, the, you know, the time, the, The time for a slow query, right, right. So the threshold, that's what I'm looking for. The threshold, you the threshold down to zero, and you will track all the queries in the server. And then you can, then there's a tool that analyzes that, that, that tells you, you know, how often the query is run, um, what the times are, um, and all that stuff. Or, I mean, to be the brother up, 
favorite help right now is we, uh, if you have support for MySQL, we have a monitoring tool that also has a query analyzer built in. So you can basically track all the queries going through the server through this query analyzer. And we'll give you nice graphs and result sets and show you which is one of the most problematic queries. But this is a useful thing to have, especially if you need to get a server back up and running. You know, and you're not using snapshots or anything else like that. Um, I wanted to point out some other utilities or utility packages that are available. So, is everyone familiar with, has everyone, or Workbench, anybody seen Workbench? So Workbench actually comes with uh, a package called MySQL nice Utilities. If you ever go in the menus and you see there's a script, menu item or something like that, this is what it's all about. Um, the Workbench, so, oh, I guess I Anybody ever run the utilities? Workbench utilities? MySQL utilities? Ah, good. So, uh, <clears throat> these are the utilities that we've developed. They're written in Python, they're open source, they're the GPL 32 license. Um, we have a set of Bayesian teams, Python teams, that we ship with the utilities so that people can write their own utilities. Um, and we handle some of the lower level stuff through these, through these uh, methods that we provide. Uh, with the package. Um, and I'll just show you a list and then we'll do a couple of uh, examples of them. So I had to install it in the user local bin. So there's things like uh, you can do a replication check, you can do replication administration. So the replication administration utility lets you um, sanely fail over or cleanly fail over from the master to another site. Um, in a controlled fashion, so if you need to do something with the master server, it's a, it's a way to cleanly build it over. There's also an auto build over utility that will watch your application topology, and if you're running by 6 and using the transaction IDs, it will auto build over. Uh, if the master goes out for some reason, auto build to one of, one of the slaves and redirects all the slaves to the new master. Um, or, and I think this is the way most people run this, that run it, the failover utility will not do the actual failover, it will notify you when the master goes out and needs to switch, which is how most people want to fail, they want to control um, But some of the, there's some pretty nice things in here. I mean, there's a user clone uh, utility. So if you've got a user set up, you know, I've set like some pretty uh, elaborate uh, privileges and different tables and you know, different privileges, and I want to just be able to set up another user with the same privileges. That's what user phones do. Um, there's one called called MetaGraph. Uh, MySQL yeah, MetaGraph. Let me show you what. I type the right number. Let me show you just basic. So the basic syntax is, and, and there's something I don't like about it. Um, you probably can see what I don't like about it, but if you're concerned about security, there's something here. So you take MySQL MetaGraph at that server, um, give it your login and your password, which I don't like, um, and a host. And then, in this case, I am basically looking for any object that has country, that begins with country.
MySQL export. So just another way to um, export data, <laughs> I suppose. Um, and oh, I see. I say, why do I have to export both? Um, so MySQL export, you know, I guess, I don't know if it does anything much better than MySQL does. Um, it doesn't have as many parameters, which kind of helps. But uh, you can export both, which is schema and data. Or you can say export just the schema, basically with the data definitions, or just the data. Um, you get, it, uh, in this case, what database I'm worried about, and then I'll export that. There was something about this export that was different. Utilities kit that, that someone else had 
you know, I got away with it. Uh, but the performance, the persona to get is emerging with those two. Um, again, very helpful information regarding, um, oh, what are they sharing with you? So, they, so they, you can do table dips if you're running a replication. So you can dip the table on the master and the slave to see how far off they are. Uh, they have, it's a ton of utilities. They have like 30 or 40 um, utilities. They can be very handy for, for looking at specific tasks. Another one to be aware of is something called the common schema. So, uh, show me, not for this, develop this, um, guy over to Japan. So the common schema, um, it, it's kind of hard to describe, but it, if you need to do what it does, you'll find it very useful. Um, so it, it's kind of a version of running a bash script to repeatedly run a SQL command and change the parameters, or just using the common schema to do the same thing. You can do things with the common schema that simplify uh, DBA operations. Like I said, it's kind of hard to describe. That's why I put a note up there. I put the link to it so that you can go and look at it um, and see what they do. Um, and he has great examples on how he uses it. But it, it's just, you know, again, it's like the merging of shell scripts with SQL commands within uh, the database. And my last, this is my last slide, one of my very favorite utilities. Who runs Sand? If I run Sandbox? Besides David, we don't have. <laughs> um, if you were responsible for MySQL and you have to test new versions or you have to test replication or something like that, this is a great utility. It's a huge time saver. So, with Sandbox, you can set up master to slave topology and binaries. All you have to do is, you basically say, make, uh, so like make replication setup or whatever its command is. Um, it will, and you tell it what version you want to use. So, um, when Peter was talking about hard distributions, the compressed hard distributions, um, it test out 5.6, maybe you're running 5.5, five. you want to test out 5.6, you download the target distribution, you put in something like OptimizeQL, maybe 5.6, just dump it in the test directory. Let's say you want to test out 5.7, you download 5.7, you put in OptimizeQL, 5.7, then you can just say, make sandbox 5.7, and you will fill with 5.7's first server. With utilities that are, and it's all self-contained, you don't have to have root privileges, everything is under your home directory. It runs under your home directory. It runs under your user ID. So you can start and stop it with scripts. You can use that server. You can change the configuration. You can do what you want. But it's all it's all contained within Sandbox. That's why it's all nice with Sandbox. It's a great user. They use it all the time. Um, like I said, for, for testing out replication, there's no faster way to set up a replication site. It's just that. Um, and I like it because if I need to destroy it, it's easy. I'm not putting it in. Just a great thing. Ton of other stuff, but uh, I had a lot of other scripts I was going to run. Any lingering questions? All right, thanks. Thank you. <laughs>
Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Astris. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Astris, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astro space systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astro or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astro. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive, easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy to implement, easy to use, strong authentication. From Wicked. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. 
you can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources, and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people. Uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it. Uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the CloudStack.